Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is the importance of flagship species, and it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leaders, Arpita Dutta and Aditya Panda. Thank you both so much for being here today. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny, uh, uh, for your wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, it's been always a pleasure to share whatever is going around in our mind. And uh, it's it's always like, I mean, webinars actually become a life right now. Uh, so today's uh, topic is all about because we travel a lot and mostly like we explore explore a lot and we explore keeping something in mind that what we all need to see we would talk about uh, to all about all those animals so before we start uh, let me introduce myself uh, this is arpita datta and i have been reading uh, working with uh, nathab since 2018 and uh, lead the india grand india nepal bhutan trip and when i'm not leading the trip i engage myself with a lot of conservation work and then i do a lot of webinars and i keep waiting uh, for people to see uh, like to come and introduce uh, and sometimes i wish to see them in person but today i have my co-presenter my colleague my friend which is uh, who is aditya aditya can you introduce yourself thanks arpita and hello everyone my name is Aditya Panda, and I have been leading NatHub's India trips since 2016. I primarily lead uh, what we call our tiger trips, the Grand India Wildlife Adventure, India Tiger Quest, and India Tiger Safari, which is a photo pro trip. Um, when I'm not leading NatHub trips, I'm based in uh, Eastern Central India, and uh, I involve myself in uh, conservation work in tiger and elephant landscapes here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Aditya, the thing is, I think today we are, we are coming across or we are doing a topic which most of the time we face, right? Uh, especially yeah. while doing the conservation work or even being a naturalist or leading the trips. Uh, we And because we both are working, it's been for more than two decade, uh, decades, so we have been facing this. And uh, the importance of uh, for conservation now, I think uh, it's a high time like we talk about or we aware, get aware about all these things. And uh, the first, which I would like to uh, like share, uh, and please uh, you, you pitch in, whenever uh, you feel like that you have uh, something to say about it, because I know even you work very extensively with this, <clears throat> that right now in the condition, like the situation we are in, uh, mostly we are losing uh, the habitat. And by forest fragmentation, I mean, this degradation of forest, uh, this ecosystem and everything. So like habitat protection becomes a very top priority to, you know, like for a functional ecosystem a healthy ecosystem because that will that uh, actually make a lot of species thrive and maintaining the balance uh, the climate even the climate regulate the climate so it's definitely a, one of the very important factor uh, sorry uh, it's it's definitely a very uh, important factor and with that uh, in india we definitely have uh, a lot of protected areas, but all these things started after India got its independence in 1947. Uh, people uh, in India, the conservationists and the foresters, they have been more, you know, they were focused or they have been concerned about the loss of habitat and the animals which uh, were been losing or the declining numbers were huge so of course the conservation was an important factor and then once uh, 
uh, Indira Gandhi became our prime minister. She was uh, very enthusiastic about this whole wildlife thing. And uh, she has introduced the Wildlife Protection Act in 1972, and which has been like introduced uh, in our Indian constitution. And since then till now, we have many, near about a thousand protected areas. Uh, so before saying it, uh, before uh, taking it forward, I would say there is uh, like, we in India, we do have like many protected areas, but these protected areas has few norms and rules and regulations. So we have national parks and state parks, but here it's all like non, human activity area people cannot go inside for their day-to-day -day work and it's all like uh, it's, it doesn't have a like a proper ba a boundary how the sanctuaries and all we generally think about so it is an open forest but a, an area of land where it has been protected for the normal people only the park authorities uh, the researchers and yeah they are they are the only people who can go to collect data and stuff and of course uh for the tourist a particular area like 20 percent of the forest have been given for tourism uh to make it more uh you know prominent or aware of it it's that is that is there and uh but we do have so many protected areas but still we are struggling because imagine because of all this degradation of forest or deforestation or in the population of india the human encroachment has been like you know we are struggling to control that that area because between two protected areas imagine there would be a piece of land where human settlement is there and if an animal need to cross it need to cross through that human settlement area this is number one. Second thing is we are losing all the natural corridors through their like passages through which the animals will migrate. And third is even after that, if there are other patch of uh, wild like forest areas, animals can roam around there as well because they really don't know what is protected area, what is a buffer zone and where the human settlement, I mean, how they should move. They find the way and they go ahead. And because of that, we are facing uh, a lot of uh, difficulties of, you know, this human man animal conflict, then poaching, uh, all this illegal trade of animal. These, all these things are there and they are sustaining. And of course, uh, I know this, uh, I mean, India is all about mm -hmm. like, it's a one third size of USA. And so according to that, we have like 2% to 2.2% you have the uh, uh, like protected area. Uh, but that is also seems very used because of, uh, because of the diversity of this country. And uh, we have more than 400 mammals, uh, imagine. I mean, think about the smaller thing which are there. And of course, that makes a lot of uh, difference that how how much it is important to have the protected area or to provide that natural corridors or for the conservation. I mean, uh, that is very important. Aditya, you have you have something uh, to add to it? Yeah, I mean, that's a very important point that you made, Arpita, uh, that uh, you know, India has its own set of challenges, very unique to the subcontinent. Um, and uh, I must say that, uh, yes, uh, we have many uh, challenges and shortcomings, but uh, we have still come a very long way, given the fact that we are one of the most densely populated and land starved countries in the world. I mean, the figures on your screen uh, that show that the area under protected areas in India is less than 5%, while in the US it's 14%, close to 15%. Um, but despite that fact, I've always said that it's uh, um, been, um, you know, a huge conservation victory, especially since the coming of the Wildlife Protection Act in 1972, that uh, almost all of Asia's 
uh, you know, large uh, flagship species, you know, uh, charismatic megafauna, whatever you want to call them, um, survive in India, not only survive, they thrive in India in their largest and most stable breeding populations, while from most of the rest of Asia, they have vanished. So, uh, yes, we have had um, uh, a lot of success. Uh, and um, yes, at the same time, there is still a long way to go. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, I think so. We all know that habitat is very important. I mean, uh, as you have mentioned that the fundamental, you know, of wildlife conservation is the habitat uh, conservation. Yeah. So what do and, uh, you what do you feel like? How How does it go? Well, uh, you spoke about how we are conserving habitat through these nearly 1,000 protected areas that we now have. Uh, I remember not very long ago, that number was 600. And uh, when I started out as a young naturalist, uh, <laughs> it was uh, closer to 400, if I remember correctly. So uh, we have been making a lot of progress. And uh, these habitats, of course, um our entire large functioning ecosystems but arpita if you look at any of our protected areas uh pick any random protected area be it a national park or a wildlife sanctuary which is similar to the state parks of the us uh, you will see that almost all of them were established with the intention of protecting a particular species um Yes, these were always rich landscapes, rich in biodiversity, but um, there was always some species whose population uh, decline in that area or whose population potential in that area caused the respective governments of the day to protect those areas. And these species are called flagship species or umbrella species. So uh, most of these species um tend to be either large carnivores like tigers or leopards uh or snow leopards um uh, you know uh, large carnivores uh, sitting right at the top of the food chain or they tend to be mega herbivores like gore like elephant like rhino and uh, the reason why they're called flagship species or umbrella species is that these um species are like a barometer or thermometer or whatever you want to call them of the entire ecosystem in which they exist the health of their population is uh, the best indicator of the health of the larger ecosystem that they occupy and uh, you know if you if you have an area if you have an ecosystem or a piece of habitat where uh, the flagship species uh, which are primarily the large carnivores and uh, mega herbivores also uh, are doing well um, then you can rest assured that the butterflies the fungi the dragonflies the birds the amphibians the reptiles must all be doing well because flagship species tend to be highly demanding species that cannot survive unless the rest of the ecosystem is doing absolutely great so uh, to so you can uh, sorry but so i mean in certain so you can say that uh, they are actually safeguarding the habitat absolutely. right absolutely absolutely and and at the same time like it is only it is not only about the flagship species but it goes beyond protecting a single species i think the entire ecosystem is getting you know, benefit it. Absolutely. Uh, you cannot protect these species in isolation. You cannot have tigers unless there are deer. You cannot have deer unless the habitat is free of invasive weeds and has excellent, um, you know, palatable plant species. You can't have those plant species and grass if you don't have a healthy insect population and bird population and so on and so forth. So yes, you're right. absolutely. Yeah, and uh, and we are glad uh, that 
uh, in our Grand India, then all this uh, like Snow Leopard, and also, of course, uh, this photo pro uh, expeditions. I mean, whichever uh, tr our uh, trips are happening in India, we are lucky to get uh, to see few a few of the flag uh, flagship uh, species uh, during our trip. And it's been incredible to see them in the wild and we get to know more about, you know, why, why is it so important? And while you are here or while we are working, we know that we, we also know that because of them, you know, this is a, they are also an icon through which public are getting aware of the rest of the species, which is very important because uh, we human are the response. I think we are the response. We we can take the responsibility, or we have done whatever we uh, we could do with the nature, and we should take the responsibility so that we can at least seize a little bit of disruption what we have uh, done already. So I think that awareness through this uh, flagship uh, species is very important, and at the same time. To save this, government and other NGOs, uh, you know, they are uh, they are also implementing various conservation programs. So this is good that we we come across these species, and definitely when it is with them, we get to see a lot more. But before we go ahead, Aditya, I know that uh, you have been to that uh, to Snow Leopard area, which I couldn't uh, make till date. Every year I plan and every year something uh, like I had to like leave it. But as you have been there, why don't you share something about the habitat and the conservation thing about snow leopard? Absolutely. Um, well, we are going to talk about some flagship species today. And uh, one of the most enigmatic among them is, of course, the snow leopard. I mean, um, uh, you know, nothing compares with the experience of being in that vast cold desert in the Trans Himalayan region and uh, scanning the mountains for snow leopards. And, you know, it's, 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 it's otherworldly, truly. I mean, very, very literally, it's quite otherworldly. You're up at, you know, anywhere between 12 and 15, 16,000 feet above mean sea level. It's, you know, if you're there in the winter, it's close to minus 25, minus 30 Celsius, and uh, it's such a phenomenal landscape. Um, Arpita, as a lot of us would know, until about, uh, what, 10, 15 years ago, almost no one in the world could expect to go up there and actually see a snow leopard. I mean, I've known so many people who have been up there and never seen a snow leopard. But, um, and, and you know, uh, there's a famous book by Dr. George Schaller called, uh, sorry, uh, it's by uh, Peter Mathison, who was traveling with Dr. George Schaller, who was working on snow leopards. And they've written an entire book uh, authored by Mathison called The Snow Leopard, where, um, you know, on that entire expedition, which produced a book, could not produce a snow leopard sighting. But that began to change about 15 or so years ago. And that change, uh, how that change happened is quite an interesting story. You see, earlier, um, very few people, there was very little conservation attention as such on snow leopards because they were always such a ghostly sort of creature. Very few people worked on them uh, as a species. And, uh, you know, the part of the world where they exist is so vast and so wild that, uh, you know, uh, there, there wasn't really much effort on snow leopard conservation. But when it started, um, you know, a lot of changes began to happen. And uh, one of the uh, key drivers of uh, conservation in snow leopard habitats today is snow leopard tourism. And um, as tourism uh, ventures and uh, conservation efforts began to target the snow leopard as a flagship species, uh, we started to see a lot of uh, revival in the uh, number of prey species such as blue sheep and uh, ibex, etc. Even Himalayan wolf and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tibetan wolf and 
uh, uh, brown bears and palaces cats and things like that. And how snow leopards are being conserved up there today is truly a uh, you know wildlife tourism conservation story. Uh, earlier, uh, the local uh, communities that live in that area, who are primarily you know livestock herders, uh, they used to see snow leopards as an enemy. Uh, snow leopards would come and kill their uh, sheep. Uh, they would enter sheep pens and sometimes kill a dozen or two dozen sheep in one night. And they were absolutely seen as the enemy of uh, herders. And uh, herders used to kill them and poison them. And um, blue sheep and other mountain ungulates up there were also hunted quite a bit. But then, um, uh, you know, some um, responsible tourism operators like the Snow Leopard Lodge, where we stay when we uh, go on the uh, Nathab snow leopard trip up there. They started working with, with these communities and they started showing them that, you know, there could be uh, a, a decent form of livelihood from actually preserving snow leopards and showing them to tourists around the world rather than killing them for uh, safeguarding their livestock. So started a conservation initiative where uh, not only were the livestock losses compensated, but uh, you know, herders started working with the lodge and started actually inviting them to come and see a snow leopard every time there was a kill. So that is something that has phenomenally turned things around uh, in snow leopard habitat, uh, especially in India. And it is something that is being rapidly replicated in uh, other snow leopard uh, habitats across Central Asia. But um, Arpita, snow leopards um, are of course top carnivores and top carnivores make amazing flagship species, but that doesn't always have to be the case, does it? I mean, uh, you also have mega herbivores like uh, rhinos, like elephant, like wild buffalo and bison in America. Uh, which are also fantastic flagship species. And you are somebody who works uh, a lot in uh, what is arguably the world's most uh, uh, densely populated large mammal habitat, which is Kaziranga National Park. And uh, you, I'm sure, have had a lot of time with rhinos and elephants up there. Could you tell us more about, more about that? Uh. Yes, that was a that was a nice introduction, Aditya. <laughs> yes, yeah, true. I mean, I always say that Kaziranga, or rather, I call Kaziranga my first home. More than my home, I have stayed there. And uh, <clears throat> you know, for last 16 years, um, I have like I have witnessed the change, and uh, still it's happening. Though it's a very vast area, vast process. And uh, because uh, when I when I read about or when I know from the local people who are pretty uh, like elderly people, especially, so you mm -hmm. get back to another 60 years that how things were right. And mm -hmm. uh, after like uh, after 19, uh, uh, like yeah, 1900, you know, about 1925 uh, and 26, uh, 26, we were left with less than uh, 50 rhinos out there. And uh, so you can imagine, I mean, I, I can't even imagine Kaziranga because whenever I've been to, I've started going to Kaziranga, I've seen rhinos, a lot of rhinos. And uh, then they say, they were, they, that's a huge effort. And then they say, is it, can it happen? Like there were some time. Um, and because we, you know, we are losing habitat and we have so many challenges. And then I think that in 1900, I mean, almost more than 100 years uh, back, we didn't have rhino. And then I seriously, it actually blown me away that how the conservation work and how, you know, the community uh, involvement, uh, the government, um definitely the whole whole they are very meticulous about the whole process the uh protection of uh, the land this all matters a lot which actually brought back kaziranga's unique and uh the most precious uh species uh the 
and of course it became the flagship uh, species of this national park and uh, with that imagine in uh, 1974 i mean even after uh, we got this uh, uh, wildlife protection act that uh, you will be pun it's a punishable offense to harm or to enter even in the protected areas and stuff we were uh, kaziranga was only with a 430 square kilometer area and now kaziranga is 914 rather another 20 uh, square kilometers is about to add maybe it will take another uh, few years uh, because already we are in the um, like the sixth addition uh, happened almost 17 years ago and right now we are on the 10th addition of i mean the extension of the national park because uh, what happens is uh, let me tell you give you a map it will be a little uh, easier to understand so <clears throat> here is uh, the brahmaputra the lifeline of uh, assam or uh, for kaziranga definitely and uh, this is the national park area and that side of brahmaputra is called the north bank and this is the south bank so kaziranga national park has been established on the south bank but right now it has been extending till here towards the north bank area and you know because i have been working on the sixth to tenth edition of uh, of kaziranga national park because that's a highland and Aditya, I mean, you know, in 2019, uh, during flood, so Kaziranga gets flood every year, and it's very bad. So in 2019, uh, early in the morning, my field assistant, um, so we have to, you know, we have to go and work for uh, the flood rescue and everything. So we, I am in my room, and uh, my field assistant went towards the river, and while coming up, uh, and my office was exactly on the bank so while coming up he saw some orange uh you know behind the bush he saw something orange mm -hmm. and he thought that most of the time we used to get a lot of deer species right. like some bird, hog deer and uh, all this so he thought that's a deer species and he started coming close after coming a bit close he saw the black stripes and he <laughs> ran for his life but and he, then he came i mean he took a round he came back almost banged my door and uh, he said that there is a tiger right beside your room i was first oh gosh what you are saying i mean you know you cannot because that's a highland and fortunately i mean i never used to cut down all the trees or shrubs uh in that area i mean uh, where where we could uh, we have our boundaries and uh, initially it was very difficult to believe but then i actually looked through my varanda that yeah there is a tiger and it was exhausted because it has to and brahma when brahmaputra get uh, flooded it's like a vast uh, like sea you don't even see the horizon uh, but i'm sure you know that so it was exhausted and it was there on the highland so and not only i this is a story i shared but trust me none of the villagers though it was we kept it very quiet only the forest department people and we have some local ngos uh guys who came and you know uh was there but the village people didn't make a sound they were not uh you know trying to come close to it and all so certain from morning till midnight we were there keeping an eye on the tiger and by 2 30 in the morning it just swim across to another uh, land which is on the core area side and exactly that happened here this area where my caster is so imagine i'm uh, sorry it's up here there is so this is this is what you know that makes a lot of difference so after this is a tiger story but there are the rhinos the elephants they all swim across towards the highland so and they have been using this for a long time and so government uh has deputed you know the uh the authority the the district authority so whichever the claimed uh landmass are there by the public or the human uh habitants over there they are mm -hmm. taking those land back 
I mean, uh -huh. which is they have claimed it. There is no paper and nothing is there. So they are taking it back to make it as a protected area because the animal have been using this uh, and they are trying to get shelter on the northern pa northern side of the bank. So whenever I go to Kaziranga, I think, and I think uh, because of this rhino, right now we have uh, more than like 2,500 rhinos are there in Kaziranga. I mean, one of the highest population uh, we have there. And with this rhino species, we are actually uh, working on other lesser faunas. You know, this mm -hmm. elephant and everything is there. Oh, sorry, the elephant and everything is there. The water buffalo, gore is also there in the wooded, wooded forest, but also the lesser fauna, which are in the endangered or critically endangered species, they are mm -hmm. also getting protected. So that's why I think it's a very lovely or, or it's a very nice word to use the umbrella species. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that uh, because I know um, there are there are a lot of uh, critically endangered species. I mean, which got uh, like upgraded to critically endangered. We were thought to be uh, like extinct from the wild. So imagine mm -hmm. because of these species, this whole habitat and everything, and we are actually seeing the abundance. Uh, or abundance of like sighting and the and the animals out there in in this park but with rhinos definitely it's a tiger reserve as well but when mm -hmm. it comes comes to tiger aditya i think no one can better uh, i mean explain uh, the majestic cat apart from you so you can talk about uh, you can tell us about the tiger well in the mega fauna yeah <laughs> well that um absolutely was a fascinating story of how um, the uh, objective of protecting the great one-horned rhinoceros uh, has ended up saving the last and the largest remaining tract of uh, you know floodplain uh, uh, grassland and uh, woodland habitat that probably exists in the Indian subcontinent today and um, Surely the rhino and the elephant and the Asiatic wild buffalo have been fantastic um, uh, flagship species for the conservation of uh, Kaziranga and uh, for keeping it the way it is while uh, the vast majority of such floodplain habitats have been uh, cultivated and are uh, almost devoid of uh, megafauna. But, um, you know, one species of megafauna that uh, has been such a such a fabulous and such an effective ambassador for conservation across India is undoubtedly the tiger. I mean, it's the largest cat on earth. It is also the most widespread large carnivore. Uh, well, maybe not as widespread as leopards, but uh, still the <laughs> most widespread. Uh, uh, you know, super predator, ultra large carnivore, whatever you call it, uh, across India. And, uh, you know, India started tiger conservation efforts since uh, actually a few years before uh, the Wildlife Protection Act was passed. Um, by 1968, India had actually banned tiger hunting. And uh, the Wildlife Protection Act, as you said, of course, came into being in 1972, and that outlawed all hunting. But in 1973, the very next year, we started something called Project Tiger, which was a focused uh, project um, to protect the tiger and the habitats in which it lived. And uh, of course, Project Tiger started in 1973 with only nine reserves but these nine reserves had been chosen to be um, you know each representing a different kind of key habitat across the subcontinent so you know while you had um, a manas in assam uh, the same state where kaziranga is you also had ranthambore in uh, rajasthan which uh, depicted uh, the dry semi-arid uh, tiger habitat and you had Kanha in central India which protected uh, moist deciduous sal forest and uh, you know large natural uh, meadows of the central India highlands 
and uh, down south in Periyar, you had uh, under the umbrella of the tiger, uh, you had evergreen forests being protected. And uh, similarly in Cobbett National Park up north, you had uh, the uh, Terai grasslands and uh, Sal forests in the Shivalik uh, ranges of the uh, Himalaya uh, being protected. So, you know, the tiger occupies a vast range of habitats. Uh, I mean, if you uh, take... Uh, if I, uh, sorry, Aditya, I, I had to interrupt it because uh, I belong from another another tiger habitat, which is Sundarbans, the mangrove. Absolutely. Uh, isn't it? it? I mean, imagine, it a... yeah, imagine, imagine the whole mangrove is saved till date because of the presence of this uh, of this cat Absolutely. and people are people are scared to get inside the forest um uh, not of course but i mean this is this is an incredible and that kind of a mangrove habitat the backwater the sa the sa i mean the salinity in the water but still they have adapted it so nicely and they have they have been like living there throughout and of course we have good numbers uh, uh of tiger in sundarbans area so of course the it's a it's a huge achievement. I mean, yes. for this for us. Yeah, it's uh, amazing that uh, the largest tract of mangrove forest in the world, on the face yeah. of the earth, uh, spread across India and Bangladesh, is saved because of this species. Uh, because uh, it was thought important that tigers of the Sundarbans be protected, and uh, therefore it was important that the Sundarbans be protected. And uh, it's such an amazing cat, uh, Arpita. You find it in the Russian Far East in freezing temperatures, and you find it in uh, Rajasthan where we go on our India Tiger Quest and India Tiger Safari Photo Pro trips. And uh, in Rajasthan, it is practically hot desert. And um, it's uh, fantastic how, uh, you know, those nine tiger reserves with which it all started in 1973, uh, that number has now grown to, I think, 54 at uh, last count. So there are, um, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing how uh, India's finest forests, uh, India's finest tracts of natural habitat are now the ones that are protected as tiger reserves. And uh, as we all know, and as we all tell our guests, uh, you know, these tiger reserves, which cover less than 2% of India's land area, are actually the source of five 500 perennial streams and rivers so you know flagship species there you have it <laughs> true <clears throat> and and another thing uh, i i believe uh, aditya that uh, you know it's difficult i mean whatever conservation stories or uh, the thing we talk about we need a we need a better conservation plan you know for planning in this heterogeneous landscape because it's so difficult to control the, I mean, to get uh, involved the local people or the human, the interaction between wildlife and people has to be stable or they have to understand that. And I think, uh, and also understand the other stakeholders uh, perspective that what do they think about the wildlife? So it's a, it's a big story. I mean, it's related surrounding all these flagship uh, species. I think we, there is a huge amount of work you know that that brought us to this and to do that huge amount of work what would do what do we need Ajita? <laughs> we need a lot of money of course and a lot of good programs that how we can save it so i always say that uh, you know while uh, conservation uh, i mean of course there are a lot of voluntary works and stuff but to keep it in process i think the indian government uh, the central government and state government, what we have is the fund for the protection of the forest and protection for the animals. And then we definitely, uh, we have uh, other sources like the, we go for grants, like which we get donations and uh, either donation or it's like for funding for the project. But uh, of course, the most of the part and uh, 
the initiative the government takes i think that is also an incredible uh, thing to do and um, of course we we have to because you know when when we talk about few points like how just like the first point, the habitat restoration and protection. So for habitat restoration, imagine what I was telling about the Kaziranga part. When a people, when a person or the family is living in that area, and you know that that is not that been claimed by them. It's, there is no legal uh, thing that they have got this land. So when you are moving them from that area, you have to give them something or some land or anything so that they can you know they can shift uh, out outside of that protected area so those things are there or uh, the local community depend on the forest for their livelihood so providing them or working with them for a sustain alternative uh, livelihood so for that you need uh, the backup and uh, you know uh, the resource and of course uh, the wildlife conservation uh, uh, it is definitely one of the biggest thing that how the monitoring and everything uh, it, it all that like all have the forest department people their uh, wages their salaries everything go even there are a lot of process where the water I mean to take care of the national though national parks we really uh, cannot do anything but sometimes uh, for example even I have to come to Kaziranga that they have actually made a lot of highlands in between those lowland areas so that at least the animal can swim and get on the top of it to save the uh, to save their life. So all these are uh, there, uh, and we in, and we have to distribute. I mean, the government has to distribute this for exact all the works, and uh, for this monitoring and surveys, which. Uh, I mean, with the with the department people, we get involved, and we know that it is so important to I mean to have a constant monitoring and surveys because that's how you actually know the habitat, you know what are the species and stuff, and of course with with that we get the uh, species uh, documentation, which generally is an addition towards the science. We get so many new species uh, like the smaller faunas and stuff. So it's it's been incredible, and of course, with all this, a huge, a big team work on uh, reducing this illegal wildlife uh, trade, because and there are like se different uh, sectors, like people who aware the local uh, people, and then we have uh, those people who are working on the field, and of course, uh, in areas, of course, we know that in tiger reserves and other uh, national parks, we have some special forces uh, dedicated to uh, those uh, protected areas to protect those species out there. So yeah, for everything, we have to have those uh, resource, uh, and that has to be distributed quite wisely uh, to keep uh, this conservation work uh, going. I think that's that's a huge thing. But I think uh, with this, of course, this is a more uh, government, uh, NGOs, uh, funding, the grant writing, all a lot of paper and pen work with the awareness and all. But I think we enjoy another uh, another way of conservation. And I think our uh, we definitely be very happy when when that part comes and that has a big role to play. And I would say, Aditya, you, you, you tell us about that. Are you talking about tourism? <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, Apita, you're so right in that, uh, uh, you know, flagship species uh, conservation definitely does tend to dictate the flow and allocation of resources when it comes to conservation matters. But um, just like uh, flagship species uh, lead to the protection of the whole ecosystem, um, in, in uh, the allocation of uh, conservation resources, be it funds, be it human resources, be it research, be it protection, uh, that all does trickle down through the trophic levels to the entire ecosystem. And uh, one of the points, if you can go back to the previous slide for just a second, um, is the one you made about uh, species uh, documentation. I mean, so many um, 
rare and unknown and lesser known species have been discovered and have received um, conservation and research attention uh, because uh, they have benefited from uh, from from the conservation of flagship species and the habitat uh, revival that that causes. But um, again, uh, with uh, tourism, you know, just like with conservation, uh, flagship species play a huge role. I mean, uh, let's be honest. Uh, all of us here, including uh, everyone in the audience cares about wildlife, cares about biodiversity, is interested in uh, biodiversity and uh, knows that it is important that from a conservation point of view, uh, tiger conservation is as important as spider conservation. But I mean, if we talk about our, you know, what, what draws us out into the wilderness, for the vast majority of us, um, you know, it is these charismatic megafauna species. It's lions, it's tigers, it's elephants, rhino, buffalo, uh, snow leopards. You know, those are the things that uh, really draw people. Um, I mean, uh, we see a lot of other wildlife, of course, while we are out in pursuit of these species, but uh, one must admit um, that um, it is really the flagship species that get in the tourists. And uh, that in turn sustains a huge ecosystem of local economies, which plays a defining role in uh, the relation between local communities and wildlife conservation. I mean, when uh, the Wildlife Protection Act was introduced in the 19 you know, in 1972, and in those first two or three decades of conservation, communities and conservation used to be at odds with each other. You know, uh, centuries old ways of life were disrupted because of the establishment of national parks and state parks. Uh, people were suddenly told that their way of life was illegal, that hunting was illegal, that grazing your cow in the forest was illegal, and uh, that was unfortunately uh, or fortunately a decision that had to be taken for the uh, interest of wildlife because wildlife was in severe and catastrophic decline in India uh, uh, at that point in time. But what played um, as a sort of uh, peacemaker here has been tourism. Now, the relationship between communities and wildlife in areas where high quality wildlife tourism is practiced has completely changed. In areas like Kaziranga or around that, in areas like Kanha or around that, you know, you ask anybody living in that area and they'll tell you just how important the tiger or the rhino are to uh, not just the landscape and the ecosystem, but to their very own livelihoods. So uh, the role of flagship species in wildlife tourism can definitely not be undermined. Oh yes, uh, I totally agree. And uh, the best part I like is, uh, uh, of course, this is very, uh, we should be honest and very true that everyone, no matter, I mean, most of the time when I ask that, what are you hoping to see? Uh, I know guests say a lot like, okay, it doesn't matter. I just want to enjoy the forest. But somewhere there is a, you know, hope of uh, if they could see a tiger or a rhino in, in those areas. But uh, after, after finishing the whole trip, I think the memories, the awareness, the conservation strategies, whatever things are happening, it's not only seeing the flagship uh, species, you know, I mean, I think it's it's the whole whole story when they take it back. And I think that's that's the most precious thing. And I think not even people who are coming from outside, but also for the domestic tourists, whenever they are visiting all the national parks to see the tiger, but they actually see a lot of things along with the tiger. And mm -hmm. that's where I think the conservation, like spreading awareness, the outreach uh, should reach where uh, we can really, um, it's a big part in uh, conservation. And when I, I say it's a big part in, yeah, tell me. 
sorry, I was saying that if we can put it in one uh, line, we could say that uh, for a lot of wildlife tourists, um, you know, who are especially the ones who are newly addicted to wildlife tourism, the pursuit of the flagship species serves as a gateway for interest in everything else from plants to birds to insects, amphibians, you know, uh, the less fancy mammals, all of that. No wonder, no wonder that you were an editor. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know. I have to express it's like too many words comes out, but yeah, it's so nicely said, Aditya. It's it's really wonderful. Um, so yeah, that is that is definitely there, and of course we we cannot even forget that uh, uh, that a lot of revenue generates uh, with that, and uh, it's not only for the wildlife because there are a lot of crises uh, in those areas. I think mm -hmm. uh, that also helps the department to take their. Uh, you know, steps. Of course, the, everything is there, but you know, those they their arch to save the spe uh, species and even the local people is because that they know that they can sustain if they sustain uh, altogether. Uh, so, imagine if even even if it's a tiger or a rhino, like rescue rehabilitation, and especially when I say that uh, the Kaziranga gets flood, so we need a lot of backup. Uh, even sometimes we need armies help. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, to rescue animals as well as uh, human being from those areas. We have special forces. And of course, these are the other, like the government uh, part of it. And of course, being uh, into the conservation work, we volunteer with the authorities and uh, uh, like other NGOs uh, to do a lot of, and we are getting the opportunities, you know, to work with the conservation because of that. Uh, because I think how much we earn, we spend, uh, a lot more in a lot more here to be honest um because something has to be do same goes with you uh i know i mean we we face almost the same because we both are working on the eastern side of india you are on the east i am more on the northeast so we kind of face the same challenges and uh, we we kind of get the same kind of atmosphere and i think it's mostly all over part of the uh, country and yes with all this everything i think being in nature or around nature uh the pleasure or it's it's more like meditation the happiness and uh understanding the abundance of nature i think that's the best part of uh being in all these areas and to witness all these beautiful uh species around us what do you say aditya absolutely um you put it really really well and uh, we would like to thank everyone for uh, joining us on this webinar and we would love to hear what questions you have for us now thank you both so much for um sharing all of your knowledge with us i always learn so much and i just love the way you make connections for us um we do have some questions would you please elaborate on how no hunting policies in India have played a role in wildlife proliferation over the decades? Absolutely. Um, you see, um, as I was mentioning earlier, we have uh, very, very different um, ground realities in the Indian subcontinents uh, compared to, say, Northern America or even many parts of Africa. Um, hunting uh, might have been sustainable many, many decades ago, um, maybe until the 1800s, when India was a vast swathe of wilderness with uh, pockets of human habitation, um, you know, existing as islands within it. Now, India is a vast swathe of human habitation with pockets of wildlife habitat existing within it. So it is absolutely impossible to have uh, what is known as sustainable hunting uh, in, in this sort of a situation. And, uh, you know, in the 1960s, uh, tigers and uh, a lot of other wildlife had started to go into a massive decline. Hunting was still legal then. And in fact, um, Arpita and I were talking about this uh, 
before, you know, while, while we were working on the slides today, that uh, one of the key drivers of the Wildlife Protection Act actually were hunters, you know, uh, hunters who uh, were people, uh, you know, uh, who hunted with morals and ethics and principles. And uh, they themselves were so appalled at the state at which uh, wildlife was being decimated that they actually hung their rifles and got together to petition the prime minister uh, to do something about it. And uh, since the ban on hunting in 1972, um, you know, wildlife has rebounded incredibly well across the subcontinent. There are more tigers in India now than there were uh, in the 1960s uh, or 70s for that matter. Have any wild tigers gotten infected with COVID-19 or is this more of a problem in zoos? Have any deer species in India gotten infected with COVID-19 in India like wild deer in the US? Arpita, you want to take that? Go ahead. Um, all right. So, um, Sunny, we haven't had any records of um, wild yeah. tigers contracting uh, COVID-19. Um, um, zoo animals might have contracted it from um, close uh, contact with humans. Um, wild tigers um, do not, fortunately, tend to have that close contact with humans. Um, also, to my knowledge, um, we haven't had any cases of deer being infected with COVID-19 either. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Was there a snow leopard in the picture of snow and rocks? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Cool. Okay, let, let, let me go back. Uh, yeah. So if you see it here, here is the snow leopard. <laughs> so imagine wow. uh, it's it's a very nice i mean good that you uh, asked this question imagine the habitat i mean it's wonderful that huge habitat that terrain a cat is surviving and expanding i mean this is this is another i mean this is how you know all these efforts and all this concept and no matter what if we give them space uh, they rebound i mean this is a, such a true story i mean isn't it that's amazing yeah. camouflage. <laughs> I'm glad you pointed it out. Yeah, that's why it's called the ghost of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the last question we have time for today. So I'll hand it back to you for closing comments. Uh, Aditya. Thank you, Sunny, And thank you, Arpita, for inviting me on this webinar. Uh, and thank you to our amazing audience for being here. Um, we look forward to seeing you soon again. I shall be off on my trips uh, that are starting very soon uh, with the new season. So I'll probably not be presenting until next month, but uh, I can't wait to get back from my first Grand India adventure of the season and tell you how it went. Yeah, even I am waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so this is the thing. I mean, it's been always wonderful to share uh, our thoughts uh, and our ideas uh, and our experiences with you all. And thank you so much, Sunny, for uh, hosting uh, uh, and so, such in so nice way. And I thank you all the viewers for asking uh, questions. And uh, you know that uh, if there are other questions, if, if it's to be answered, we will do that. And thank you so much, Arit. It's always such a pleasure to uh, like present with you because I keep on narrating things and you make it so precise and nicely you uh, say it. So I always I always learn uh, from you. It's, it's always a wonderful thing. So all of you have a great day. And uh, Sunny, you too. And I think good night. <laughs> uh, see you, see you soon. See you all soon. Thank you both again. That was fabulous. And we all wish you safe and satisfying travels out there. We look forward to hearing from you when you get back. I also thank want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon.
With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.